Good morning. So glad you decided to join us this morning. And also I want to welcome those who are online listening to us or viewing us. I want to welcome you very much this morning of our Bible study. We are studying the first Thessalonians. We completed last week the chapter one. Today we will be looking at chapter two. So if you kindly open your Bible this morning and follow me as I read 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. <clears throat> you know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dare to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please people, but God, who tests our hearts. You know, we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover, the, cover up the greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you, just as a nursing mother cares for her children. So we cared for you. <coughs> because, excuse me, because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked a night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses. So is God of a how holy righteous and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. An amazing portion of scripture, 12 verses, here by Paul to the church in Thessalonica. We looked at last week how marvelously God has demonstrated his love for that church, how uniquely God called them. They were chosen by God. And Paul was so excited when he heard about the good reports, how well that church was doing. And today, when you read these verses, you really get a tone of Paul is defending his ministry in Thessalonica. Why do I say it? It almost like, it. here's my imagination. He's in the court as an attorney. He is defending his position, what he did at the church in Thessalonica. 
How do I know that? Let, let me show you how this chapter starts with. Look at what the first two phrase. You know. Now, that two phrase in the 12 verses we read, it is repeated six times. Look at these verses. Verse 1, you know, you know, brothers and sisters. Verse 2, we had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. Look at verse number 5. Verse 5, you know. We never use flattery. Verse number nine. Surely you remember, you recall. Verse 10. You are witnesses. So Paul is using that terminology to give us a flavor of defending his ministry in Thessalonica. Now, let me tell you why I say again. Look at chapter 3 for a minute. Look at chapter 3. I like to call your attention on verse 5. Chapter 3, verse 5. Now, look at this, why Paul is writing this. For this reason... When I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in the, some way the tempter had tempted you and that our labors might have been in vain. But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought a good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have a pleasant memories of us, that you long to see us just as we also long to see you. So he is already seeing in verse 4, somebody in Thessalonica, they are spreading wrong information about Paul and Silas and Timothy. So they're kind of accusing them. What are the accusations they are bringing against Paul? Now go back to chapter 2. Chapter 2, you will see verse number 3. We appeal, we make, appeal we make does not spring from error, or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. To me, that is a base. When you, when you analyze this portion of the scripture, those three words in verse 3 is the key to understand this portion of the scripture. So somebody in Thessalonica they are accusing Paul, Silas, and Timothy. They are teaching error, false doctrines. They are not teaching the truth. So they are accusing him of that. And second thing, they are accusing him of, they have impure motives. And we'll look at what they are and we'll, we'll get to that. Then the third one is, they are deceitful. They said they trying to trick people. So those are the three accusations that is bringing against Paul in that church. So he is taking that position to defend and telling the Thessalonians, hey, listen, I want to make sure you understand what's going on. You know. 
You know we were there with you. You know we are told you the truth. But he also said, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we have been preaching the truth. We've been telling you about the gospel of God. And how do I know that had an effect? Effect. He said, verse chapter 1, verse uh, 9. Look at uh, uh, verse 9 and 10. For they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead. Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath. So he is saying by our presentation of the gospel to you, you have been delivered from the pagan style and way of worship. You have been the saved from the worship of idols, and now you are serving and worshiping the living God. So he is giving that truth to the Thessalonican church. That's why, let's go back to the chapter 2, verse 1 again. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without any results. The results are already there. You yourselves are converted. You yourselves have turned from your idols to the living God. So the results are you have been evidencing by your lifestyle, by your conduct, by the way you are living for God. You just demonstrated this. So I know, I know, and so does you know, our work was not in vain. That's what Paul is nailing out. So he said, verse 2, we had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dare to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. So we looked at this when we started the introducing this book. We looked at Paul was in Philippi. In Philippi, God used him miraculously. And you remember a lady named by Lydia. And she got converted. She got saved. And she entertained Paul and Silas and Timothy and the 16th chapter. But what happened in Philippi, Paul was preaching. Silas, Paul and Silas, they were preaching the gospel. All on a sudden, if you go back and read the book of Acts chapter 16, you, you see this story. <coughs> there was a, a fortune teller being hired by people they used to her, she had the evil spirit in her, so she has the ability to forecast the future, tell the future, <coughs> excuse me. Thus, they made money off of this lady. So when they saw Paul and Silas, she is screaming and following this guy several days and said, these men are... God. Men from God, they keep saying. And after two, three times, Paul became annoyed. So he turned around and said, in the name of the Lord, let the demon come out of it. The bad spirit, the evil spirit, come out of her. She got delivered. Well, that just caused uproar in the city. Those guys who were making money off of this lady who telling this fortune, and they got upset. So they said, we got to bring charges. Look at it. We are losing no more profit with this lady. So let's take him to the magistrate and accuse him. So what happened? 
They got stripped. They got beaten up. His back is opened. And they put him in the prison. And they're in the stocks. Stocks is a wooden frame. They stretch the legs and the hands, being locked and put the head in the certain location. And they were sitting there and suffering and agonizing in pain. But at the midnight, here is a supernatural thing that is happening to them. In the middle of this torture and persecution and suffering, Paul and Silas singing, this is the day that the Lord has been. I mean, they were clapping their hands. They're trying to sing song in the middle of night uh, while they were enduring the pain in their life. What happened? God supernaturally delivered them. The great earthquake came and the chains fell off and the four gates were wide open. The jailer heard this noise and he thought, oh, oh, the entire prisoners have escaped. He was ready to commit suicide, pull his sword. And then Paul cried out, hey, don't do any harm to yourself. <clears throat> we all are here. That day, the entire jailer's family got saved and got baptized. Now they realize these men are really God. Magistrate reversed his decision. He said, go tell them. They are free to go. So Paul said, we're not going that way. We are the Roman citizens. You cannot treat us in that way. So they said, you publicly tortured us. We endured the suffering. You mistreated us. We are the Roman citizens. If you want us to go, then you got to come here and escort us. That's what they did. So he is telling them, now he is being sent out from Philippi to Thessalonica, and he is saying, that's the background of the verse 2. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi. As you know, what do you know? But with the help of our God, we dare to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. So even when we have endured such a suffering and agonizing, we're coming to you. We did not change our strategy how to present the gospel to you. We are still coming to you with the same boldness, knowing that one city tortured us, beat us up, and we're back is open. We are in pain, but that ain't going to alter our conviction, our decision, our focus on the gospel of God. So he is trying to convince them, you know, we didn't change our strategy. We, coming, we are coming to you with the boldness. So that beating we took it in Philippi gave me boldness, courage to come and declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. He will deliver all of you from just like what happened. The idol worship will be thrown out. You will come and serve the living God. That is the gospel message. The Christ who was crucified, the Christ who was raised from the dead, we're going to proclaim that Jesus is coming back. That is the gospel of God. These men coming to this church in Thessalonica and spoken to them boldly without altering any strategies. So he says, you know, we didn't change anything. We are coming to you with that kind of courage and kind, what kind of boldness we're coming to you. Look at verse 3, we already look at. We appeal, we exhort you, we want appeal to you. We did not come to you with any error. We told the truth 
and the word of God. And the word of God will set you. The truth shall set you free. And you yourself has been a witness to it. So he said, we're not coming to you with the error. But that's the next thing. The impure motives. <clears throat> impure is in there, has the original language, gives us this meaning. The impurity is the uncleanliness of the sexual connotation that is applied to them. See, we have seen in those days, the false teachers are sexually involved with the newly convert people. And they take their money. That is a one sign of being a false teacher or false prophet. So he's saying in those days, in the Greek mythology, the Greek temples were full of prostitutes. They encounter sexual um, relationship with the temple priest. So they're coming from there. So they were accusing Paul in the same context. He's a false teacher. He's a false prophet. He is giving you wrong information, Thessalonican church. Believers don't believe him. He is trying to find sexual favors from all of you. That's what it is implied there. We did not. So Paul is defending. We did not come with any impure motives. Neither did he say what? We're trying to trick you. Put a mask on our face. I know some of you have them. Oh, no, you're not disguising that. You're just complying with the, our uh, rules and regulations here. So I'm saying we are not here to trick you. We are coming to you directly by being honest and proclaim to you the truth and the gospel of God. That's what he is defending. Well, let's go on. Verse 4. On the contrary, so after he addressed those three things, the error, impure motives, and trying to trick you, he said, no, we're not doing that. On the contrary, what do we do? We speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please people, but God who tests our heart. We are coming to you by the authority of God. We are approved by God. The message we're speaking is approved by God. And we are the apostles being sent out. God, as a witness, we're telling you that truth. And he said, we're not interested in pleasing anybody. And they're not there to boost their egos. Man, I have that problem. Man, I love to hear kudos coming to my way. But I think God knew that. That's why he gave me a wife like Molly. So keep me humble before God and making sure I've been checked out properly. I have some balance in my life. Oh, amen. Who said that? <laughs> okay. So he said, on the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God who tests our heart. So he said, listen, I am putting myself out. I am coming to you along with the Silas and Timothy. I'm telling you, God knows our hearts. We are coming to you. I am telling you, you got to believe us as opposed to those who are trying to spread bad news about us. Are you following me? Okay, let's look at verse 5. You know, we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask 
to cover up greed. God is our witness. He said, listen, now he says, we didn't come to you to trick you. And he said, we didn't even put a mask on us. So pretending to be somebody or our hidden agenda and the motive is trying to get money from you. Make more money by speaking that way. Paul was not interested in that kind of money-making technique. Instead, he was one worked very hard. He was a tent maker. He worked with the leather. So he used that as a trade to earn money to support throughout his entire ministry. He collected money from the churches, not for himself. He took that money to the poor people in Jerusalem and other churches. So he gave that. He was such a generous man. He did not want to put any obligation to anybody. He did not want to put a burden on anybody. He worked hard day and night in order to support himself and his brothers co-laboring with him. So he said, our motives were not making money. Verse 5, one more time. You know we never use flattery nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. Again, he's defending in front of those people as God as our witness. Look at next verse. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have a certain our authority. So verse 6, he's coming to the conclusion, he's telling them, listen, we could have exercised the authority that God has given as an apostle and inserted that and used that authority over them. But he said, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not looking for people's flattery. He's not interested in that but we're coming to you to bring the real truth. That truth shall set you free. That truth is none other than the gospel of God, gospel of Jesus Christ proclaimed to them by Paul and Silas and Timothy. Verse seven, instead we were like young children among you, just as a nursing mother cares for her children. Okay, I think a time is flying away, okay? Let me, let me stop with this comment about that. After he defended his position, listen, I'm coming with the truth, the word of God, which is mandated by God not interested in your own praise about me. I think God knows our hearts. We're declaring, coming to you with the pure motives, no hidden agenda. We have proven that to you, and you know that as an aspect. Then he using this illustration of a mother, and later he used father. So he said, we came to you like a mother, a nursing mother cares for their children. We cared for you. We nurtured you. We protected you. We provide enough support and love for you. Thessalonians. That's what he's starting out telling us. But listen, I can't go any farther. 
we just came to our time to stop for this week. But we will pick up the parental examples Paul is using as a mother, as a father, how he provided the care for the church in Thessalonica. Would you please come back so we can explore this further? Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. God bless you. Looking forward to see you all next week. Have a wonderful week. God bless you.